Would you turn in your Bibles to Revelation 11? And if you will remember last week, we didn't get finished. And to the relief of many, I just said, we'll finish this later. And so later's today, Revelation 11. I say for the relief of many, it was we were, we were getting a little long and and I wouldn't want to get the reputation of being a long-winded preacher, so I salvaged myself. Okay. Could you stand for the reading of God's Word? We'll read one verse right now, verse 15. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, sounded the trumpet, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And He, Christ, shall reign forever and ever. Why don't you read that last part, starting with the kingdoms with me. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And He shall reign forever and ever. You know, whenever you approach these Revelation chapters, there's so much there, but there needs to be a theme for the moment. And I believe that moment, this moment, this morning, the theme is this, and I really believe this theme. Those that are truly prepared for the coming King are those whom the King already rules from the throne of their heart. That's it. Those that are truly prepared for the coming King are those whom the king already rules from the throne of their heart. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, speak through the preaching of the word. Help us to hear from heaven. May Jesus be exalted. Lord, we feel your presence here, but as we preach, may there be a growing sense of your presence as you speak to us, as you encourage, as you challenge. Lord, as you strengthen, Lord, perhaps you even convict of the life that isn't being lived under your lordship. And Lord, give us a time in these altars where eternity draws near. And God, help me as I preach. Help me, Lord, to have all distractions removed internally, Lord, and externally that I could be shut up with your truth. Oh, Lord, help us to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit at work. Holy Spirit, anoint this servant in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. You can be seated. There are certain buzzwords, it's usually the media that propagates them, but they go in and out of fashion. And a buzzword that's in fashion right now is regime. And actually that started back at the Bush administration, maybe a little bit before, but folks started talking about a regime change. And that's what I want to preach about today, the regime change. And they were talking about in Iraq, and now later they've talked about it in Libya and Syria, but they talk about a regime change. A regime is a changing, a regime change is a changing of what's in power. A changing of the government that is in power and has authority. There's also a radio commentator, I wouldn't mention his name, but he keeps the word alive because and that our current president seems to make a lot of executive orders going around circumventing Congress. This commentator talks about this current administration being a regime. And I'm not looking at that in the political sense. It's just to know that that word is being used and being thrown around has become a buzzword. What is a regime? A regime is a period of rule. It's the time when one individual person or one government is in power. I want you to know there's going to be a regime change. It is coming. The coming of Jesus Christ, our Lord, will institute the regime change of this world. It is going to happen. I know God is ultimately in control, but he has allowed Satan, the prince of the power of the air, he's allowed Satan for a time, for a period, to have power over this earth and to rule over this earth. Yes, now get this clear. Yes, God is ultimately in control. But I want you to know Satan does rule this world. It's it's an ability that is given to him temporarily of God. But Satan rules this world. 
He rules the institutions of this world. If you don't believe he rules, let me make this statement. He rules the entertainment industry of this world. He rules the governments of this world. Let me back up. Why do you think there's so many movies about zombies and and horror and death and and evil? I'm telling you, because he rules. He rules in those things. I mean, I could talk about how he rules the governments. But the most frightening thing is Satan rules the hearts and the minds and the souls and the lives of billions of people. Even Satan is in control of their life. I've heard young people when I talk to them about commitment, they'll look at me and say, I'm through with that church. I'm of age now and I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do my own thing. You know what bothers me about that? When somebody says, I'm going to do my own thing, I'm going to live my own life, why is it they always go out and do the very thing that Satan would have them do to destroy their life? You see, when you say I'm doing my own thing, you're really not. You're doing Satan's thing. The way I understand Scripture, every heart and every life is either under the rule of Jesus Christ or the rule of Satan, the rule of darkness. Amen. And so Satan does rule. He is temporarily in power. But there is coming a regime change. Satan will be dethroned and Christ will take his throne hallelujah the prince of darkness will be removed from this earth and the prince of light will shine his everlasting light in a reign of peace and holiness and righteousness amen there are questions people ask about the end and they're rightful questions someone may ask am I prepared for the end they may ask am I prepared for Jesus coming. Am I prepared for the judgment? I need or you need or we need only answer one question. Is Jesus the king of my life? Is Jesus the king of my... i tell you who's ready for the end, who's ready for the judgment, who's ready for the things to come. It is those who Jesus is Lord and king of their life. Am I I am not ready for the coming king unless he already sits on the throne of my life. Jesus is coming to set up his kingdom visibly on this earth. His kingdom's already here invisibly through his people, through the church, through the power of the Holy Spirit. But he's coming to set up his kingdom visibly. And here's the problem. Our society is not used to the surrender to a high higher power. Some of it's in our national patriotism. I mean, we got rid of one king, didn't we? Amen. So we don't want to surrender to any power as individuals. This is the frightening thing. Going clear back to Joshua. We're living in a society where every man does what is right in his own eyes. That's the way folks run their lives. That's the way Christians, many of them, try to run their lives. Preachers not going to tell me what to do. Sunday school teacher's not going to tell me what to do. Youth pastor's not going to tell me what to do. I'm going to run my own life. It's a dangerous thing to just simply do what's right in your own eyes. Anybody here this morning say amen? But not only as an individual, but as a government, our society is at the place that what 51% of the people want, that's going to be the law. That's going to be the move. That's going to be the rule. I'm telling you, all of those things are wrong. We might as well get accustomed to it. There is a kingship. It's either a king of darkness or a king of light. And we're either living our lives under the kingdom of darkness or the king of dark, or we're living our lives under the king of light. I don't know how you feel, but I'm glad for the day I let Jesus, King Jesus, come in and be the king of my life. That's the kingdom of light. I know it has become a cliche. You heard it much back in the 70s and the 80s. The cliche about there being a throne in your heart. The preacher would preach at Brother Steve and then he would ask the question, who sits on the throne of your life? Who sits on the throne of your heart? Is it self? 
Is it lust? Is it sin? Is it your own way? Your, or is it Jesus that sits on the throne of your heart? For so many, it's self that sits on the throne. I'll do it my way. I'm self-sufficient. I'm going, I'm going to have it my way. I'm going to do my thing. It's all about me. Self, that's a miserable person right there. It may not have caught up with you yet. Amen. But it'll make you a miserable person. Oh, but it doesn't have to be that way because Jesus can sit on the throne of your life, your heart, your thoughts, your future. I'm telling you, if you've got Jesus on the throne of your heart, you're ready for the coming King because He already rules your life. He's already in control. Oh, hallelujah. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead and He is Lord. There is a test of whether Jesus is king or not of one's life. And it's an easy test. And Jesus gave us the test. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Could I preach this morning? If Jesus has not come first in our lives, He is not king of our lives. Amen? Does His word come first? Does His church come first? Does prayer to Him come first? Amen. Does His will in your life come first? If He does not come first, He is not King of your or my life. And listen this morning. I know the Spirit of the Lord is here. And if you have any sense of God's presence, if you have any sense of the moving of the Holy Spirit, you would know exactly the thing in your life that inhabits the throne of your heart rather than Jesus. If that's a true thing in the moving of the Spirit, you know the thing that's on the throne rather than Jesus. I want to tell you, for your current peace and for your eternal salvation, if it's not Jesus on the throne, bow hard in life to Him in repentance today and say, Jesus, I've let other things on the throne of my life. Oh, and I regret it. But Lord, would you come and inhabit the throne of my life? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Satan and darkness have control of it all. Or at least it seems that way. Amen. Everywhere we look, it seems He's in control. But aren't you glad, church, there's going to be a regime change? It is coming. I mean, and all of those who have prayed the prayer I just mentioned, Jesus in heaven, my throne, they will be ready. Amen. Let's look at the terror that results from the coming king. Amen. Last week we talked about the two witnesses. They have been slaughtered and left to lie dead in the streets, unburied. The indignity of being unburied. Why were they slaughtered? By the beast, the Antichrist. Amen. Why did the people rejoice when they were killed? Simply one reason. They preached the truth. They told the truth about humanity. They told the truth about the Antichrist, about Satan, about God, about sin. And having told the truth, the world did not want to hear it. And they slaughtered these men. Oh, I thought when I got done, said I wish I'd said it. But I immediately thought in the Old Testament prophet in Isaiah, he said in judgment, is turned away backward and justice standeth afar off for truth is fallen in the street. Truth is fallen in the street. When they slaughtered those two witnesses that preached the truth it could be said those men were the truth and they were slaughtered in the street. But three and a half days later the spirit of life, the spirit of God the Holy Ghost of God entered into those decaying bodies. Their soul and spirit came back and they rose up before the eyes of the world resurrected. And the Bible says this world was filled with fear. Why? They're being deceived by the Antichrist. They're seeing false miracles. They've seen the false preachers with the false miracles. But when God resurrects those two witnesses, 
There's nothing false about that. Their bodies have been decaying before the TV cameras and now they're standing up and not only did God resurrect them, He raptured them. He took them to heaven and the whole world feared. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, we need a moving of the power of God that will cause a fear to enter into men's hearts when they see with whom we have to deal. Hallelujah. How many knows he's got all power in heaven and earth? How he could resurrect you this morning. Your heart's dead. Your mind's dead. Spiritual life is dead. He can resurrect it. Hallelujah. We are witnessing the death of truth, but the truth is going to rise again, even in America. Verse 13, they're already fearful, but at the same hour there was a great earthquake. The tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake, and in the earthquake was slain of men 7,000, and the remnant were affrightened, and they gave glory to God. Now we've got to get this. They're frightened. This is, these are wicked people. These are people that killed the two witnesses. They're frightened, scared out of their gourds. I mean, they were just terrified at this display of power. And they gave glory to the God of heaven. Now listen, folks misunderstand this. They say, well, these folks got saved, didn't they? They're giving glory to the God of heaven. And by all indication, they did not get saved. They did not repent. But they had to concede. They had to admit that that power was a display of a living God. They had to admit it was not fakery. It was not illusion. It was not magic. It was the power of the living God. And they had to give glory. You say, well, it sure sounds like to me they got saved. They're giving glory to God. Don't forget what Paul said. He said, because Jesus died made himself of us no reputation and he died for our sins it says that one day every knee go ahead put the scriptures there in Philippians every knee shall bow wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They didn't get saved but His power was so undeniable and real they had to bow their knee and say we have refused Him. We have rejected Him. We have slandered Him but we must admit we must acquiesce that He He is the almighty living true Lord and King of all the earth. I'm telling you, every knee is going to bow. Every knee of every hypocrite. Every knee of every backslider. Every knee of every atheist. Every knee of every agnostic. Every knee of every Muslim. Every knee of every Hindu. Every knee of every person will bow and confess that Jesus is Lord. I'm telling you, everybody's going to bow either now or then I've got some advice bow your knee now say you're my Lord forgive me you're my Lord save me you're my Lord take control of my life you're my Lord live on the throne do it now that you might not have to do it later I'm telling you I want to bow to him we're thrilled to think that Nero will bow We're thrilled to think that Hitler will bow. We're thrilled to think that evil atheists will bow. But the question is, am I bowing in full surrender to the Lord? And then in these verses, we have the trumpet that announces the coming king. Verse 14. The second woe is past. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Just a quick quick review we'll get to this do you have the one with the 777 there and if if not I'll just I'll just explain it one more time we started off with the vision of seven seals the first four of those horsemen and horses that wreak havoc upon the earth and that fifth seal we read we talked about that those souls 
waiting for vengeance in the sixth seal, the cosmic disturbances. And then there was an interlude before that seventh seal, and we discovered that in the seventh seal were seven trumpets. And those first, those first four trumpets, when they were sounded, was judgment poured out upon men's environment, sea and land. It was awful destruction. And then the next two trumpets, they were the, the awful demonic forces that were unleashed from the abyss, the abyss, the bottomless pit upon man himself, tormenting spirits, painful spirits. But if you'll remember in the sounding of the trumpets, after those first four trumpets had sounded and, 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 and judgment had come upon the environment of men, there was an angel eagle that circled, hovered midair above the earth and screamed, the bird of prey screamed, Whoa! 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 In modern language, doom! 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 Three woes are coming. In other words, things have been bad, but they're going to get worse. Those first two woes were the fifth and sixth trumpets. That's when we're demon that's when demonic forces were unleashed upon the earth. Then in chapter 10, and now in chapter 11, we've had an interlude before that last trumpet is sounded. And that last trumpet represents the last woe, that third woe. And we're going to discover that that last trumpet is when Jesus comes as judge of all the earth. Verse 14, again, the second woe is past, and the third woe cometh quickly. That last trumpet is the trumpet announcing judgment. And who's going to judge? The king. King Jesus. Verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded. There were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. I don't want to get the trumpets all confused in this thing of the end time. All I want to remind you of is a trumpet. Whatever the announcement was, it was the means of announcements. How of announcement. Amen. And I know from the writings of Paul that ever born again believer ought to be listening for a sounding of a trumpet that's going to signal the coming of our Lord and we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye hallelujah the dead in Christ will rise first and we which are alive I don't know all about the chronology I just know there's going to be an announcement made church get out of here there's going to be an announcement of a trumpet made. Judgment is coming upon this earth. Amen. No more precursor. No more interlude. No more day of mercy. Amen. The door of the ark will be shut and sealed. I don't know how you feel, but I think the church needs a revival of a fear of the coming judgment. And with that revival, have something birthed in our hearts. I want to be ready. I want my family to be ready. I want the church to be ready. Hallelujah. I want to be ready. Thank God he's made a way to be ready. This trumpet sounds to announce the coming king. Kingdoms of this world are over. The kingdoms of our Lord have arisen. He'll reign forever and ever. He comes as a judge. We have a picture of King Jesus and we can't but have just a, just a, I don't know, just a weak facsimile of what it will be when he is ruling in all his glory. But it says the kingdoms of men will literally be conquered by, absorbed in, and ruled by the kingdom of Christ. Now you've got to understand we haven't got here much, got there yet much, but right prior to this trumpet, that beast, that Antichrist, he arises. He brings about a coalition of the governments of this world. And this has been clamored for ever since the ending of World War I and even before this one world order, this one world government, everybody coming together in one government. It's going to happen under the Antichrist in a rebellion against God and everything that is holy, everything that's absolute. Men will coalesce together and 
form a one world government but they won't have it long I said they won't have it long because Jesus is going to come and every kingdom of man will become his kingdom in other words what I'm saying is there is going to be a one world government but the antichrist isn't it the one world government is when he comes and he rules and he oh he must rule until he hath put all enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be destroyed is death but the dead in Christ shall rise hallelujah hallelujah I'm telling you he rules and reign the devil's but a temporary reign but one day we will see it we will see it ever knee bowing ever tongue confessing and Jesus ruling not invisibly but ruling visibly in this world hallelujah how many wants to be a part of that oh hallelujah then we see the 24 elders we've seen them do this several times they're worshiping the coming king I mean you think Pentecostals stand up and sit down a lot these 24 elders they just get seated and somebody says praise the Lamb oh, praise the Lord. they get up out of their chair and they throw themselves down bowing and throw their crowns down and worship the Lamb And the trumpet sounds, the king is going to earth to rule. The 24 elders, verse 16, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Oh, thank God for worshipers. I've said often in this series, if if you're not comfortable with worship, you probably don't want to go to heaven because that's the main occupation of heaven is worship. Even in church, we've made it about us, our talent, our resources, our ability. Look how good we are, how well we sing, how pretty we are. I'm telling you, there's none of that in heaven. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the Lamb. Oh, they fall down to worship Him and to give praise to Him. Brother Heath and I was talking about worship Wednesday night. And I just talking out loud. He knows all these things. But I'd say, you know, in the Greek, the word for worship it literally means to kiss towards. And it came from the time when the underling, the subject would come in the presence of the conquering king and he'd throw himself down on his knees and upon his face at the king's feet and he would literally kiss the king's feet or the ground at the king's feet. However you look at that, that's homage, that's reverence, that's respect, that's an acknowledging of the ruling power. You know, we have not worshipped. We can do our little ditty, you know, we can throw our hands back and say thank you Jesus and go through our ritual but we have not worshipped until our hearts are in the state of surrender our hearts are in the state of yieldness saying he is king he is lord his word is the rule of my life oh I want to be a true worshipper don't you I said I want to be a true worshipper they fell down to worship him they acknowledge his supremacy they acknowledge his power and authority they see it clearly what this world cannot see. They see that Jesus reigns. Jesus rules. Jesus is in control. And I want you to know even though these are occupants of heaven, I want you to know their reverential fear. I'm not on a soapbox, but I am concerned. We're raising a church world in our society that has no fear of God. They move frivolously into the church. Their worship is frivolous, indistinguishable from an audience at a ball game. Amen. No reverence. I'm telling you, when we come to the house of God to worship Him, there ought to be a reverential fear in our hearts. Amen. There's no one like Him. He's a mighty God. We're not here to play games. We're not here just for social interaction. We're here to worship the one true living Creator, Redeemer, Almighty God. And those 24 recognize that. Verse 18, they said that thou shouldest give reward unto thy 
servants, the prophets, and unto the saints, unto them. Here's the reverential fear. Unto them that fear thy name, both small and great. We don't have a phobia of God, but we have a reverential fear of God. I want to tell you, God isn't the big man upstairs. God isn't Santa Claus. God's not the ultimate God, a grandfather. God's not a genie in a bottle. He is God. There's none like unto Him. There's none compared unto Him. There's none beside Him. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's everywhere present. He is everlasting. Hallelujah. There's none like Him. He is God. We don't play games. We don't bargain. We don't negotiate. We just say, you are God. And we give our lives to Him. Why don't we just stop, pause and worship Him? Oh, hallelujah. Come on, let's worship with reverence and godly fear. One of the main reasons they feared is because He is the King and the Judge of all heaven and earth. I'm not going to digress. I'll just make a simple statement. Forget science. The thing about behind the whole evolutionary Big Bang, etc., is a moral thing. It's simply this. People do not want to bow their lives to a creator. So they find a way to dismiss him. I'm glad I know the creator. I got to thinking about this fear. Some time back we went to the Grand Canyon. And I want you to think about the Grand Canyon. It's a place of beauty, majesty, and wonder. But why does it have beauty and majesty and wonder? Because the fear you have when you look over the rim. If there was no fear in the viewing of the Grand Canyon, no picture will do it justice, not just because you can't capture all the hues in the picture, but you've got to be there and see the distance that you're looking at. And if you take the fear out of the experience of the Grand Canyon, you also take the majesty and the wonder and the awe. And I'm telling you, listen to me, please listen to me. The church has lost its sense of wonder and awe in worship because it's lost its sense of reverential fear. You, can almost, you can't hardly resist getting as close as you can to that rim and looking over. But it's that pull, that fear, that makes you stand there and wonder, amazed. And I'm telling you, to fear God isn't to repulse the soul of man. When folks really fear God, It'll be just like those that keep getting closer and closer to the edge of the Grand Canyon. They're filled with fear, but it draws them in the awesomeness. I'm going to tell you, if we could see God and who He is, oh, there'd be majesty. We've sung it 2,000 times that we would start singing. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great. Except with God, we're not doing this, we're doing this. How great thou art. A reverential fear. Hallelujah. I said a reverential fear. Why can one laugh with their neighbor about some nonsensical thing while the church is worshiping? No fear. Why can somebody check their Facebook status during the preaching? No fear. Why can one bend over the pew like he's praying but the whole time he's connecting to an online game? No fear. Why can somebody watch movies with sexual, occultic, anti-God themes and never worry about not being ready for Jesus to come? No fear. I'm not going to bore you with old stories, but I remember in sixth grade, I got to sleep over with a friend. He had a TV. We didn't. TV went off at 1 or 2 o'clock, but they had had an Elvis marathon going where they were playing Elvis movies. And we stayed up till the TV went off watching Elvis movie. And I didn't sleep the rest of the night. I just knew Jesus was going to come. And I've been watching the Elvis movies. We need some kind of fear like that. I'd been involved with the wrong king. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why can one share sexually subjected messages over the social media, not fear, or, or, or not be bothered by it because they have no fear? But I'm telling you, that fear of God isn't this psychotic thing of torment. That fear of God is that which brings all and wonder majesty in our lives then I want you to notice the time of judgment of the coming king the nations were angry the people groups thy wrath has come the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets and the saints and to them that fear thy name small and great see there it is again them that fear thy name small and great and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth Notice here it says the nations had been angry. They were angry at what? The truth that the witnesses were preaching. And they rose up in their anger. They pouted and they shook their fist at God and killed His witnesses. I want to tell you something. You can get rid of the preacher of truth, but you're not going to get rid of the truth. That didn't change a thing. Amen. You can say, well, I know a place I can go to church and I'll never hear a message like this about judgment and about the coming of Jesus and about fear. You may, but that doesn't change one little bit the truth of what you're hearing this morning. Amen. They were angry at the truth. I've seen that. I've seen folks get angry simply because the truth was preached. And because they were angry, the Bible says, Thy wrath is come. God said, that's enough. You're not going to treat my witnesses that way. You're not going to treat my... I've given you ample opportunity upon ample opportunity. And enough is enough. And the righteous wrath of God is shown in the secular world today. It's joining in with the radical Islamic world at being angry at anyone who believes this Bible is the Word of God, the absolute truth, and stands for it and declares that the lifestyles this Bible says is sin or sin. Our secular world is coupling with the radical Islamic world at being angry at Christians and you can say you're way out there. Listen, I'm not even a prophet. I don't claim to be. I mean the best I can claim is to be a teacher. So this is just a teacher talking. But I see it coming. There's a growing wrath and anger towards any of those that would stand for truth. But I'm telling you, let this world get angry. Because when it gets angry, God's wrath is going to say that's enough. You don't treat my, you treated my truth that way once. You nailed my truth to a cross once. You're not going to treat my servants like that. I'm going to come and judge this earth. Oh, hallelujah. He's coming. And when He comes, there will be a judgment. Look at this verse 18. It's a time they should be judged. And I'm not going to preach today. It'll come later. But two things happen in the judgment. He says there, number one, the righteous will be rewarded. Thou give reward unto thy servants, the prophets and the saints, and them that fear thy name. And the second thing that's going to happen, the dead are going to be raised for this judgment. It says it all in this short verse, the time of the dead, that they should be judged. The time of the dead, look at verse first part of verse 18 the time of the dead that they should be judged the dead are going to be raised for this judgment and it's going to be twofold the servants of God the faithful are going to receive a reward there it is and then those in the last part of the verse those that destroy this earth are going to be destroyed not into oblivion but with an everlasting destruction that goes on and on Look, I'm not here to stand against anything. This, this isn't a scientific statement or anything or political. But people are so concerned about hairspray and cows and emissions from cars destroying our earth. But I want to tell you what's destroying our earth. It's the wickedness of men. Wickedness is destroying our earth. And here it says that the king will destroy them that destroy the earth. 
Oh, I want to be saved. Hallelujah. Amen. Last of all, the temple in heaven. That's the home of the coming king. John sees this in verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Amen. The temple represents the presence of God. The thunderings represent the coming judgments, the lightnings. But in his presence, there are two things. His presence presence is the source. What John saw, the temple of heaven, is the source of the coming judgment of those who are not ready. And yet, his temple is the place of sanctuary for those who let Jesus be king. You may not remember, but our chapter, chapter 11, began with the vision of the temple on earth and it ends with the vision of the temple in heaven. And the message to God's people is the same. However bad it gets, God's presence will be a place of safety for his people. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad he's made a place of safety? Some of you are going through awful things this week, but he has promised to be a sanctuary for you. One scripture from the Old Testament, Ezekiel said, therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them afar off among the heathen, his people Israel, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary sanctuary, a little temple in the countries. Things are going to get bad for my people. Amen. They're going to be in a foreign country, a wilderness. They'll hang their harps on the wheel. Things are going to be bad. But if they'll look for me even in a foreign land, I will be. They're removed from the temple. The temple physical has been destroyed. But if they'll look for me, I'll be into them a little temple. I'll be into them a sanctuary right where they're at. It's not just the church. It's not the temple in Jerusalem. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care how much of a wilderness it is. If you'll get to looking around, you'll find that God's presence will be a place of sanctuary and safety. It'll be a te- Are you glad there's always a temple for the people of God? Oh, it's a wonder of wonders that we are called the temple of God by Paul. Yes, that's true. We are a temple of the Holy Spirit. But never forget not only we are the temple of his spirit, he is the temple that gives sanctuary and safety to his people. Would you come, music? Only by our hearing and accepting truth can we enter into his temple. For a period of time, my mother worked the afternoons after she got us off to school. And so... When we got home, it's still a little bit before she got home from work. And uh, I learned something in a hurry. It was how I behaved before she got home that affected the way I looked at her coming home. If I'd locked my brother out of the house and made him pay his allowance to get in... If I'd broken something, I didn't much look forward to her coming home. She got home before Dad did. But if I had been doing right, those rare occasions, I looked forward for her to get home because when she got home, she fixed the meal. It's time to eat, you know. But the way I behaved in her absence determined the way I looked at her return. And it's the same way with Jesus. It's where we're at that determines how we're looking for his return. How are you looking for his return? I want to end with a simple question. Is Jesus on the throne of your life? If he is, you can look forward to his return. If not, is it joy? Is it anticipation? Or is it apprehension and fear? All depends. Is he on the throne of your life? One of the things I I do not want to do, I do not want to preach theoretic messages. I want to be doctrinally correct, but I'm not here just to preach doctrine. I'm here because Jesus, in this age of grace and mercy, he is reaching out for every heart and every life. And the thing that's so disturbing to me as a pastor and I'm sure to God 
is the very moment he's reaching out to those that have never heard to bring them in. There are those that have heard for years that are on their way out. Is that the truth? But I think the message of his coming should do both. It should bring in those that have never heard and those that have turned. They ought to catch it. Catch a hearing of that and say, no, I don't want to go that way. I want Jesus to be king of my life. I got to quit. Would you stand so I'll quit? Someone came in this week and or told me, I, I can't remember, gets emails and people talking to me. And someone told me this week about a man that they knew lived wickedly, knew of no bedside conversion. And yet that man at his funeral got preached right into heaven. Look, I want people to make heaven. I don't want anybody not to make it. But preachers are doing a disservice when folks know the life somebody lived and yet they say they went to heaven. A judge, that, that's in the hands of God, I know. But if I don't know, I'm not going to tell folks that I know when I don't know. Amen. But that has created a society that believes, honestly believes, it doesn't matter how you live or what, what that, everybody's going to heaven. And that has bled over to the church that everybody is going to be ready when Jesus comes. I don't believe that's true. I don't believe that's true. I, I'm not, I can't preach another sermon, but don't forget those five virgins outside knocking that were not ready when the cry came forth, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Let's pray. Lift your heart and hands on. Let's pray across the bed. Come on, let's pray, church. Jesus, 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 King Jesus. Go ahead and say it, King Jesus. King Jesus, hallelujah. King Jesus, hallelujah. What about it? Is he king of your life? Does he rule from your life? I wonder if we'd just be honest. Everybody's praying anyway. We don't have to bow our heads or anything. People are praying. Folks are talking to God. But you're here. And you say the honest answer to the question, is Jesus on the throne of my life? The honest answer is no. If that's you this morning, God's here to help you. He loves you. And if you answer the question, no, Jesus is not on the throne of my life, would you begin to come right now and fill these altars and say, Jesus, take up the throne. Get that other thing off the throne, Lord. Help me to excise it off my throne and let you rule from my throne. Would you come right now? Don't hesitate. We're talking about eternity right now. Amen. Come on, listen to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Anything, amen, other than Jesus is on the throne of your life. And you say, I don't want it to be that way. I want Jesus to be on the throne. Remember the premise this morning. Only those who have Jesus sitting on the throne of their life will be ready for the King. Amen. Amen. Would you come? Anybody else? Amen. Are there others? I know God's talking to you. Don't hesitate. Just go ahead and come. See, I cannot honestly say that Jesus is on the throne of my life. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Let's pray. Amen. Anyone else like to come? See, I honestly can't say. I honestly can't say. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Let's pray one more time. God, move by your Spirit. Oh, God, may there be a stirring. May there be a shaking. May there be a moving. Lord, help us to realize we're on the precipice of this thing. We're on the brink of this thing, Lord. And you're getting a group of people ready to leave. Hallelujah. 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 Let me put it this way. Amen. There's something in your heart that says, I want to be ready when Jesus comes, when Jesus returns. If you can answer that this morning. If you can say there's something in my heart that says I want to be ready when Jesus comes. Would you come and fill these altars? Amen. Say Lord I'm bowing to you right now. I'm bowing not only physically. I'm bowing everything in my heart. I'm bowing everything in my life. I'm bowing my mind, my emotions, my life total and complete. Hallelujah. I'm giving my all to you. Hallelujah. 
Amen. Answer the question as you bow. What's on the throne of my heart? Amen. Who's on the throne of my heart? What's calling the shots in my life? What am I I listening to? What am I in bondage to? Amen. It can be Jesus. King Jesus ruling and reigning supremely. Oh, come on, church. Fill these altars. Let's pray this morning. Let's call out to Him. Let's reach out to Him. Hallelujah. If you're here this morning and Jesus is not Lord of your life, you've never surrendered to Him. Oh, He died for you. He wants to meet you in these altars. He wants to change your life and your eternity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just bow your heart to Him. Oh, He's King. He is King. He is King. Come on, church. Let's pray. Hallelujah. 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 He is King. He is Master. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah.